We seem to be in a fog. Almost everyone here knows it. We head into briefings about the threats to our security, from foreign interference and espionage to cyber and strategic coercion. And the threat assessments are chilling. But when we walk out of those secure meeting rooms, we act like nothing's wrong. We prepare generic public statements and no one is moved. We miss our recruiting targets. No new ships are built. And our dialogue with our most trusted friends and allies, to quote one ambassador, is languishing. We're sluggish to the point of apathy. And why is that? In 1963, President John F. Kennedy gave a speech conferring honorary citizenship on a man his father had ridiculed for being a warmonger, but whom he himself admired, and that man was Winston Churchill. JFK said, in the dark days and darker nights when England stood alone, and most men save Englishmen despaired of England's life, he mobilised the English language and sent it into battle. And that's the problem, isn't it? We're not moving because we haven't mobilised our language. We need a change of language, and it must start here in the halls of learning. We all need to bring something, and this morning I've brought with me a 1,300-year-old Nordic fighter given new life by the contemporary feminist author Maria Devana Headley and her punchy translation of Beowulf. In 2020, Headley gave the world a fresh look at the Swedish warrior of the 6th century. And with new eyes, we saw his passionate devotion to his Danish ally, Prothgar. We saw the existential threat they both faced from a hell dweller known as Grendel, a dark, terrifying enemy. And for all of us here who care about defending this great nation that we love, protecting our democracy and securing our future, I think her work is a gift that spits truth. Its language shakes us awake. It has the feel of a populist poem, as she notes in her introduction. Now, there, were t there are two other translations to consider alongside hers, J.R.R. Tolkien's 1926 work and Nobel Prize laureate Seamus Haney's grand epic from the year 2000. Headley finished hers during the pandemic in 2020, and so she writes in her introduction, Beowulf depicts edge times and border wars, and we're still in them. Her work has an edginess to it, and she grabs you by the scruff of the neck with the first word, bro, bro. While Tolkien translates the first word of the story as low, and Heaney begins with so, Headley starts with the word she heard so often when she was serving beers in bars, bro. Beowulf is an epic poem about us, living, breathing people right here, right now. It's about the human condition and our universal quest for security and peace. And while Headley's Beowulf is courageous and powerful, he is vulnerable and flawed too. When he first fights the monster, it hurts. Knuckles buckled, joints unjoined. And like so much ancient literature, Beowulf holds out enduring lessons. And for us in the defence community, almost immobilised by fo foggy language, it pushes us to take two bold steps. Step one, to use clear language in articulating our threats, our objectives and strategic direction. Step two, to speak more honestly with the Australian people about our vulnerabilities, about the threat and about the need to arm so there's a social licence in our defence policy. Step one, use clear language in national security leadership. Let's be open here. Throughout our history, Australia has enjoyed the strategic protection of a dominant English-speaking democratic power. At Federation, we enjoyed protection from the United Kingdom and the benefits of Pax Britannica. That protection was challenged in the First World War by Germany and ended sharply and brutally in February 1942 with the fall of Singapore at the hands of the Japanese Imperial forces. Prime Minister John Curtin, only a month later, gave a speech in March of 1942, broadcast on Radio Australia, signalling that Australia looked to America 
as the paramount factor on democracy's side in the Pacific. A very nice and clear message. Since then, we have enjoyed protection from the United States as we wove ourselves into the post-war order of Pax Americana. This protection has not come without cost, though. Like all areas of life, there are trade-offs. One of the trade-offs for enjoying the benefits of Pax Britannica and Pax Americana is that we have been obliged to defend those respective orders with our blood and with our treasure. To be blunt, we have defended the values and interests of our senior partners with more than 100,000 Australian lives over the last century. And we wish that the world was a safer place. We do. But security is never final and complacency is almost always fatal. For the United States, the dilemmas of dominance are more acute and urgent than ever before. From the Red Sea to Israel and Gaza, from Ukraine to the Taiwan Strait, we are seeing breakouts of strategic disorder across the globe. And they matter to Australia as we feel the impact and see the fractures to Pax Americana. Authoritarian powers and their proxies are on the move. Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, Hamas, Houthi rebels, to name a few, undermine the order that underwrites our peace and our prosperity. And we all know that China is undergoing the biggest peacetime military buildup since the end of the Second World War. That's not a secret. It's not a secret at all. But behind closed doors, the analytical consensus is clear. We are facing a grave and deteriorating strategic situation. But disturbingly, there is a vast gap between the closed door analytical consensus inside government and the public conversation that the Albanese government should be leading. Worse, ministers of the Crown use obscure and bureaucratic language when talking to the Australian people about our threats and challenges. And everyone here in this room knows that language matters. We're being let down. The language we currently hear is everything that George Orwell warned about in his 1946 essay, Politics and the English Language. He called such language pure wind. Let's start with the phrase preventive architecture. This is the language used in a keynote address at ASEAN by a cabinet minister, and we heard it again last night from the same minister. Preventive architecture. What does that actually mean? It sounds more like strategic contraception than it does deterrence. <laughs> no one really knows. It is, as Orwell says, largely of euphemism, question begging, and sheer cloudy vagueness. Next, consider this phrase, this time from the Deputy Prime Minister only last week at the Sydney Institute. The man charged with explaining what deterrence mean said this. It means having the capability to engage in impactful projection through the full spectrum of proportionate response. I don't know about you, but I can visualise nothing at all, except maybe President Josiah Bartlett asking a stunned White House Situation Room about the virtue of a proportional response. And for the West Wing tragics in the room, that's season one, episode three. <laughs> this sort of language is pure wind. But try this for an image. Beowulf confronts Grendel, the, nurse, the monster nursing a hard grievance. He cannot use his sword in hand-to-hand -hand combat, nor can his men use their ancestral blades, as no blade on earth could ever damage their opponent. So Beowulf waits in his bed for Grendel to attack him. He uses surprise and grips his arm so tightly that he cannot escape. As Headley writes, his bones cracked, but he could not wrestle free from the clasp war wedded to a woe-bringer who clung like no human ever clung, keeping him close. Beowulf tears off Grendel's arm, who retreats and dies in his lair, his hourglass emptied by the struggle. Can you see that image? I can see it, and I see the point. We can't rely on old ways of thinking, our ancestral blades, if we hope to deter our adversaries. We must discover our own asymmetric, vice-like grip so that if we are attacked one day, we can surprise and tear the arm off an adversary. 
and we hope Pillar 2 of AUKUS yields plenty of asymmetric vice-like grips. If our friends from Japan join us in that quest, we will be stronger for it. But our people need a strategic narrative more potent than preventive architecture or impactful projection to help them get there. That's step one. Step two, to speak more honestly with the Australian people so that there's a social licence in defence policy. A failure of defence advocacy to the Australian public has consequences. It puts our greatest endeavours, like the Quad Security Dialogue and AUKUS, at risk. Shingo Yamagami, recently Japan's ambassador to Australia, wrote an open, le open letter this week saying that since he left the country he had come to love, he has rarely heard the foreign minister even mention the word quad when she speaks publicly. Mr Yamagami said that because of our current vague language, the security dialogue with India, the United States and Japan, which Australia once led, is now languishing. The defence minister needs to speak openly too about AUKUS. We need to talk about the money required to fund AUKUS, the new basing requirements for the submarines in Perth, and the housing that needs to be built for US and UK families posted to Australia in support of AUKUS. We need to talk about nuclear reactors, their operation, maintenance and disposal. Instead, we see the government refusing to discuss nuclear power at the very time they need to be open about it. Once Labor assented to nuclear submarines, they depth charged their own opposition to a civil nuclear industry. Now they find themselves unable to talk about submarines and the nuclear industry we need to support it. And social licence is built through ongoing public advo advocacy. And for that reason, I applaud Professor Medcalf and his fresh initiative of nationwide community consultations on security. It is vital work. But Rory, your initiative doesn't let the Deputy Prime Minister off the hook, I'm afraid. It is his job to lead the conversation, the national conversation, on defending our shores. Nothing is more vital to securing our future than AUKUS, but a failure of this government's advocacy will put it at risk. There is a recruitment and retention crisis in the Australian Defence Force. We are not recruiting enough people, and people are leaving for other career paths. This comes at a time when we should be growing towards our 2040 target of an additional 18,500 men and women in uniform. And this failure of advocacy has ominous consequences. Weakness is provocative, and I think the historical record reflects this. We don't want a future Prime Minister ever repeating John Curtin's words of 1942, where he said this, and I quote, we, the Allied nations, were unready. We have all made mistakes. We have all been too slow. We have all shown weakness, all the Allied nations. Now our eyes are open. We don't want our eyes opened by war. And right now, the Albanese government is weak at articulating the threats that we face. Weak at communicating our strategy to defeat those threats. Weak at advocating for resources and capability that we need in the years ahead. Now is not the time for vague language. Vague language means vague goals. How can we defeat our national threats if no one is clear about what the threat is? And we must, therefore, shake ourselves from this apathy. As we provide national security leadership, we must speak plainly about the threats. We must avoid pure wind. We must speak more honestly with the Australian people so defence has the social licence it needs to build its capability. So I urge you to dig deep into literature and history to find the new language that we need. I found it in the feminist translation of Beowulf. I picked that up in 2022 at Kramer's Bookshop on Connecticut Avenue in Washington, DC, a great little bookshop. And when Beowulf speaks to assure the leaders of countries in his region, he doesn't use vagaries. He says with clarity, I knew my plan when I set off for this coast. Before I put my band in that boat, already I was bent on victory. I meant to give you a show to make you sleep safe or to be slain myself.